So can everybody hear me? Hello? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Professor. And so Ben, say something so we know that they can hear you. Everybody. Oh, perfect. I've got it shared. Can everyone see the slides now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So hi, everybody. Welcome to part two of General Adversarial Networks. Um, I'll start with any pressing questions. Feel free to shout them out now, later, whenever. Just let me know. Um, so last time, we covered some of the basics of what uh, a GAN is. Uh, this time, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about a couple different GAN um, architectures that are useful for different applications of a GAN. And then we're gonna get into the actual GAN optimization and what that looks like and some of the, the, the details of what it's actually doing. So with that, um, we're gonna finish uh, the end of these slides just really quickly. Um, and where we kind of left off last time, if I get back to it, Uh, where does this section start? Sorry, one second. Um, here we go. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple different GAN architectures that we can work with. So what we talked about originally is the basic GAN, which lets you produce samples from a distribution, like create some faces. Um, these different architectures kind of take that basic GAN, the basic discriminator, and the ability to compare distributions and kind of what we talked about and make it into, maybe I don't just want to have a distribution, I could do a conditional distribution. I could convert from one distribution to another distribution, things along those lines and what the different uh, flavors of GANs might be. So the original GAN, that's what we talked about. That's, I've got a face, I've got a bunch of face examples, I want to make more faces. I've got a bunch of uh, speech. I want to make more speech. That is just a GAN and what a GAN does. Uh, then we can look at what a conditional GAN is. If a GAN generates from a distribution, a conditional GAN generates from a conditional distribution. Um, so you can generate data conditioned on a label, conditioned on something else. So instead of making a network that produces faces, you can make a network that produces female or male faces or a network that produces one of the digits. And if you give it a number, it will produce uh, images of that number. That would be an example of a conditional GAN. And the way you make a regular GAN into a conditional GAN is just by adding this Y as a second argument to the discriminator and as a argument to the generator. So you generate something conditioned on Y and you discriminate it in your discriminator, you look at that image and the label of the image in combination. And by adding in that extra label to those two different functions, suddenly you can uh, create conditional distributions instead of just sampling from regular distributions. Um, this is just a, a picture of what the conditional GAN is. Um, and all you'll see is that this extra Y gets added in to where your discriminator would and your generator. Your discriminator would usually just take an X, now it takes an X and Y. And your generator would usually take in a Z, and now it takes in a Z and a Y. And that is your conditional GAN. Uh, relatively small change, but it gives you a lot of power because now it's a conditional distribution, which is uh, plenty of problems that you might have. Um, and just as a quick example, I mean, not, the, not the highest quality, but instead of just producing random digits, it can produce zeros, it can produce ones, it can produce twos. So this is producing images conditioned on the label. And that's what, what people are saying when, they're, when they, they say conditional. Um, LAPGAN is a interesting application of conditional GANs because they created a chain of conditional GANs. 
Um, what that basically means is that they create a GAN, which makes the small image. And conditioned on that small image, they make a more detailed image. So one interesting application of a conditional GAN is to denoise data. You can denoise data by conditioned on blurry data output sharper data. That's an example of a conditional GAN, but you can actually chain multiple conditional GANs together to make uh, something that is less sharp into something that's very sharp over the course of several iterations. Um, this is just a, a visualization of the lap GAN and what they're doing. Um, if you guys are familiar with uh, Laplacians, which is more of a, a vision thing, and this is slightly more of a, a speech class, but basically um, differing levels of detail can be broken out into what's called a Laplacian pyramid. And the GAN is actually able to generate each level of blurriness, basically. Um, the uh, Laplacians are basically different levels of uh, details. So edges at one scale versus edges at another scale. And by going through each of the levels, you end up with a very sharp image that's uh, created over several different uh, iterations. Um, a kind of similar idea is uh, recurrent adversarial networks, uh, which also does some iterative changes, but this actually writes to a canvas and starts drawing onto a canvas. Um, the original uh, a similar model for VAEs was actually called draw. So um, you're able to uh, iteratively condition on things. You're also able to do things uh, even in a recurrent neural network where it's the same thing that's able to just rerun, do some updates, modify a canvas. That can also be trained with uh, GANs and with discriminators to uh, provide the loss function. <coughs> Um, some of the results of the recurrent adversarial networks, um, you can see it actually drawing it periodically um, and, and making a sharper image as it goes along. Uh, categorical GANs, uh, pretty interesting. These actually bring in some semi-supervised abilities. So categorical GANs can learn clustering with a GAN. Um, you can kind of think of it as similar to the uh, conditional GAN, but you're inferring those things that it's conditioned on. You're saying there are, let's say, maybe 10 categories, and then what 10 categories help me generate the data the best. So um, by this clustering of a categorical GAN, you're able to do things like um, Here's actually a hard clustering problem is these two uh, rings, these two rings that are inside each other. And when you do that with k-means, when you do that with many other clustering mechanisms, you will get uh, the rings mixed up. But because cat GAN is using a GAN to do the clustering, you can put those two rings and it'll cluster the inner donut and the outer donut as two separate clusters because the, the cluster membership is being represented by a neural network and what cluster membership is the most meaningful and helps you reproduce the data the best. Um, so you're able to get um, different shapes than something like a k-means where you're basically just getting a ball around each thing. That's one new application of, of GANs. Um, ben, for the cat GANs, and, uh, how is the, uh, uh, this is unsupervised you said, right? <laughs> It can be unsupervised or it can be semi-supervised, and that's kind of the, the power of it. So in the unsupervised case, what would the architecture be like if you want to do, say, this problem with the two circles? Oh, did I not have the formula here? I don't, I don't think I did. Um, it's that there are, okay, I should probably pull it up really quickly. Uh, probably should have put in the original uh, formulation. Uh, sorry, it's covered over by my by my Zoom meeting right now. Um, ba -ba -ba. So please, uh, I've, I've put in some links at the bottom, but I hope you guys all look at the uh, 
so feel free to look at the papers and ask any questions you have. Um, I think it was about halfway through. I could be wrong. I should find it later. Um, try not to get too distracted right now. Um, let's see the categorizable. Right, so the discriminator takes in both the category and the uh, the real and fake data. So let's see. I think it was a discriminator for each category. Oh, they could be wrong. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, now I'm remembering. It's uh, you discriminate and identify the category, and you want to have a high. Um, a high probability of being in a category. So that was actually the uh, the way that it does it. So it's the, the two different objectives of, yeah, the overall distance in all the categories. And if I remember correctly, you're trying to uh, have a high or a, a low entropy label. Um, So that's right there, yeah. The uh, sigmoid of the label, then the actual regular discriminator, uh, discriminator loss. So it's basically adding on to your regular discriminator loss, um, the categorization ability. And then if we look in here, we can apply it to the un, or the uh, supervised, I was looking at the right one. Yeah, category-wise, relativistic objective is the uh, the entropy function I think we were talking about. But I would have to dig into that in a little more detail. I'm sorry, it's been a few years since I pulled up the actual paper. I'm not sure where the uh, where everything is necessarily off the top of my head. But I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that if you guys are interested. Or I'll, I'll post on Piazza about the details. Um, yeah, so CATGAN is the uh, clustering semi-supervised learning. And here is their k-means versus cat -gan. Was I looking at the right paper, honestly? I don't see that image right now. I'm not sure where. Yeah, that, actually, this, this might be a slightly different paper. I'll have to check the link. Because uh, the, the image I have clearly is that. And I'm not seeing it in this one. Oh yeah, actually, you know what? That's 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 that is just a different paper. Actually, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's a slightly different version of Cat Gan. That's the Gumbel Saltfax one. Yeah, I think that might just be a popular. That might be a popular abbreviation. Then I'll have to pull up the actual. Oh, I think this is the right one. Yep, that sounds right. It's this guy. Sorry about that. Got to click on the wrong label to begin with. Um, yeah, here we go. Right. So it's trying to maximize the entropy of the distribution of the discriminator. So basically the discriminator, instead of just outputting, it is true, it is false the true false or the uh, the real fake indication is indicated by the entropy of the labeling distribution. So what happens is the discriminator, instead of having a single output, which is it's real, it's fake, it has, let's say 10 outputs and it tries to categorize into an output if it's real and if it's fake, it tries to give a flat distribution which doesn't categorize anything. So instead of one being real, zero being fake, it ends up being a one like a bunch of weight on zero being real, or a bunch of weight on one being real, or a bunch of weight on two being real. And in that basically, uh, you're minimizing the entropy of the output without considering the uh, uh, right. So it tries to output uh, zero or one, maximizing it for fakes. Right. That makes it a concave optimization problem because it means either put a bunch of weight on one or put a bunch of weight on two, but don't put, but if it's, if it's fake, don't put weight on anything. So that's kind of the, the differing 
abilities, but then that also means your discriminator is outputting a category and those categories that it falls into um, are just shaped by the neural network. So, so sorry, I've, I've pulled up the wrong one for a second. But um, I hope that's a really interesting take on things because it allows you to provide some supervision for some classes where it says your discriminator should definitely say a one for this guy versus for other images, you might not give it a specific label. You just say it's real. Therefore, the distribution should have a really low entropy or really high entropy if it's fake. And then you can mix those two different types of supervision to do unsupervised, semi-supervised, whatever you want through again, so that both uh, is able to reproduce images, but then give you the clusters of those images and makes a uh, discriminative network that's able to categorize those images as well. Um, so it's a very nice extension to GANs and what they're able to do. Um, the InfoGAN is also very intriguing. Um, this goes back to some of the questions that you guys had about what the hidden space is, what the latent space is, and what it looks like. Um, the InfoGAN was an attempt to make the hidden space more meaningful. That we typically are able to map things onto a latent space, which means we're able to generate things. It means we're able to make changes to the hidden space and then see those changes to the outputs just like we're able to take man and subtract woman and add it to king and then get something in word to that kind of set. So we're able to do vector math using a GAN, but sometimes you're not really clear, like what is dimension one? What is dimension two? They, they don't tend to be very meaningful. And InfoGAN tries to make those dimensions more meaningful by adding a reconstruction term. So, it says some random data, some latent data is able to generate an output image, but then I also want a function that can go from my output image and recover my input data. Okay. So by adding that in to your GAN, you're now saying that your uh, latent space should be recoverable and if your latent space should be recoverable, that means it should be meaningful. So I, I briefly showed you some example uh, before we, we ended last time, but what we see here is that um, an individual dimension, you know, you might have 20 dimensions you embed the digits into. When you use an InfoGAN and you're recovering things, then you end up with very reasonable, you don't know what necessarily a dimension is going to end up uh, corresponding to ahead of time, but you might find that once you run your InfoGAN and you start trying out each dimension, you'll find out, oh, this one figured out to represent rotation. This one figured out to represent the width. This one figured out to represent the type of digit. So you're able to see these different um, changes where um, where some of these things are meaningful. You've got different sliders, each slider has a meaning, and that puts you at the level of control of, of sliders, really, of what you would want to have. That you can control things, they're meaningful, and that means you really understand what's going on. Um, adversarial autoencoders are a relatively important uh, model because they allow you to do even more and they can actually be combined with several other of the things that are in here. Um, but what an adversarial autoencoder does is it's maybe slightly like a VAE, slightly like a GAN, somewhere in between kind of. Uh, but basically what you do is you have a autoencoder, just a regular autoencoder, and that little latent space in the middle you try to make that similar to a Gaussian. So it's still using the GAN technology, but instead of just taking a generator and saying the generator output should be similar to my images, you do an autoencoder and you say my middle 
a hidden layer should be similar to a Gaussian. It's the same discriminator framework to make one distribution match another distribution, but instead of making the outputs match your images or whatever, you're making your hidden representation match your prior. So that you can think of that like a VAE. You can compare an AAE to a VAE. They both have an autoencoder and they both have a, an extra term which is regularizing that latent term, that little centerpiece, the hidden encoding, to be similar to a prior. The difference is that you're making it similar to the prior using a discriminator versus using a KL divergence loss like a VAE. Um, <clears throat> what's nice about that is it's not a bound on how far you are from the prior. It is actually a measure of how far you are from the prior. As I've kind of tossed around before, it's uh, a choice that you often have to make in machine learning that's important to understand that you can have an approximation. Very frequently, you'll have this choice between uh, a very fast approximation that isn't exactly what you want to do, or you'll have a very slow, um, or I should really say that you, should, you can have a bound, which is going to be fast and can be analytic, or you can have an approximation, which might be slow, which might require sampling, but is really what you're, you're looking to do. So an AAE is actually directly solving if the divergence between these two things is the closest versus a VAE is solving a much simpler bound on how close they are and using that in its formulation. But that does also mean that it's faster to train and easier to put together. It doesn't require sampling because it's more of an analytic approach instead of a, uh, it, when something's hard to do, you can either do a bunch of samples to get around to it or you can do a bound on it. And that's kind of a two directions you'll frequently find yourself choosing between. Um, here's the basic AE architecture. If you want to see what it looks like, it takes in latent samples from PZ. Remember, Z is our latent. And it outputs your adversary here. But then it also has at the top an autoencoder. So at the top, you see the autoencoder. But then that middle part of the autoencoder that you would be putting into a VAE and the KL loss, instead, you put it into a discriminator and you get a discriminator loss. Still similar technology, but that allows you to be much more flexible because it doesn't have all the advantages that maybe necessarily a GAN does, but an AAE is important because it's just an autoencoder. So it's very easy to use on recurring things, to use it on discrete inputs, discrete outputs, whatever. Um, discrete outputs are relatively hard to train in a GAN. It's possible, but it's trickier. Versus um, you can have an autoencoder with discrete inputs, discrete outputs, but a continuous hidden representation. And then use the AAE to make that continuous hidden representation look like a Gaussian. And that gives you the ability to generate, let's say discrete inputs and outputs like text or something in a very easy manner, um, but still uh, directly solve the problem that VAEs kind of give you this blurry uh, representation of. In terms of what it actually looks like in a comparison, um, it's similar to an autoencoder, it's similar to a VAE, but it's much more heavily regularized. And visually speaking, um, there's some comparison of what happens. So if you were to train a variational autoencoder, it's trying to make your hidden representation look like a Gaussian. But when you actually do it, C, and you were to visualize it, C is about typical of what you would get if you were training a VAE. So this is a VAE that they put um, the 10 digits, I believe, of MNIST into, and each color is a different digit. So you see they look kind of like a ball, but they don't actually all get encoded into 
a Gaussian really well. Versus your adversarial autoencoder here, you see a very clean ball and you don't see any gaps. So when you were to walk across, this is, this is a representation of latent space. So you see that the latent space is completely full of images. They're very tightly and neatly packed. And that means you can walk from one image to another without going through anything weird. Versus in your VAE, you have all these gaps and those gaps are going to be where you are going to see weird things, blurry things, et cetera. But they're not very well filled in. So VAE will tend to give you much, or VAE will tend to be easier, but in terms of uh, cleanly getting your results, uh, your GAN when you get it to work correctly is gonna be much sharper as, as you see in those images. Um, this is actually a, a pretty tricky uh, GAN formulation to wrap your head around. So if you don't get it the first time, that's all right. But uh, by GANs are very important too. Um, they give you an autoencoder, a full autoencoder that's completely GAN based. It doesn't need a reconstruction loss or anything. Um, so these are really powerful networks and they're built with a GAN, um, but they basically have kind of a, a pair of GANs which are going back and forth. Um, so in this one, you see the V, which is normally just using a discriminator and a generator now has an encoder. So the bigand has a full encoder and decoder. And what happens is you are running things through the network two different ways. You have real noise and you put that noise into the network and you get outputs and you have real, real images that you can put into your encoder and get predictions of what the noise would have been. You take those two pairs of data and you try to tell the difference between the two of them. And that's what this formula is trying to say. So X is an image and EX is your encoding of an image. So there's a pair of an image and an encoded image. And this right here, so that's a real image and encoding a real image versus this right here, this Z is your random prior samples, which is what you want your hidden space to be and stuff generated from those samples. And what this discriminator is trying to do is to say that it can tell the difference between the two of them as we saw before and try to make them similar. So it's basically saying the relationship between real images and how I encode those images, that distribution should be exactly the same as random samples from a Gaussian that have been generated into images. So here D is trying to tell you if X and EX corresponding to the same, correspond to the same element? I'm sorry? What yes, is D trying this to is, say? This is, this two inputs in different dimensions. Yes, this is you take an input image and you encode that input image and that pair of variables which is the image and the encoded image, each pair of those should be indistinguishable from each pair of uh, generated images and the data they were generated from. Gotcha. So it's- so instead, of just the, instead of just the latent variable, it's looking at the input and the latent variable simultaneously. Right, it's looking at those pairs of, the discriminator is looking at a pair of image and encoding, image encoding pairs, and there are two different pairs that are going into the system. One is real noise generating fake images, and one is real images generating fake noise, I guess you would call it, or the, the encoding. Um, I should have a picture of that right here. So the request, there are a couple of questions on the uh, uh, chat, take a look. Oh, did I not? No, I don't have it full screen in the chat. Let me make sure I add that. More chat. Oh, sorry about that. I'll, I'll have this up during the, the rest of the lecture. So how does the AE work in practice compared to the GAN? High quality images, but training stability, VAE, blurry images, training stability, best of both worlds, any problem with it? So in terms of stability, it's much better because GANs are very hard to train 
um, but they're also kind of big complicated networks because the, the GAN structure itself is hard, but you're also doing a GAN with a big convolutional neural network, whatever. So one thing that's nice about AAEs is that your, your GAN portion, the GAN is running on, a, on the encoding, which might be a you know, 50 dimensional Gaussian or something simple versus in a full GAN where that discriminator part is running on your image, your discriminator is running in 700 dimensional space with CNNs and a bunch of stuff. Versus if your discriminator is running on the latent space, it's running on this small Gaussian, simple, whatever, and it can do it much more effectively. Um, <clears throat> the problem with the AAE is that you're losing the ability of the GAN to, um, you're, you're losing its power as a perceptive distance. So what you're, the difference between VAE and AAE is your latent encoding is suddenly going to be much sharper. So you get that advantage completely. That's, that's taken care of. What you're missing out on is that the inputs and the outputs of your encoder, of your autoencoder, are still being compared with an L2 or whatever your loss is. So in your, in your AAE, you have your autoencoding loss, and that autoencoding loss is still a traditional loss. It's L2, it's L1, it's whatever. It's something that you engineer um, versus if you have something like a GAN or a BIGAN or some of these other models, the, um, the thing that's comparing your input images to your output images is actually a neural network. So let's say your neural network sometimes shifted the images slightly, had some jitter in the space of the images that was imperceptible to the human eye, you would see it exactly the same way you or me would, but an L1 loss might be a huge number. So basically, AAE solves the problem of how good the latent coatings are and that you're training on the right distribution. A couple, um, it definitely tightens from a VAE, so comparing a VAE to an AAE, uh, not too much extra work, but should be much sharper. Um, but the actual ability to start talking about this perceptual distance and um, being able to compare things in a more meaningful fashion than just the L2. Um, so really, the AAE has two different losses that you're putting together, one adversarial loss and one traditional loss, versus something like the BIGAN. The BIGAN only has one loss. And that's that these pairs match up with those pairs. Um, it, a BIGAN can do basically what a VAE does, but a VAE always has two losses. You make a VAE with, here's your autoencoding loss, and then here's my regularization type term, here's my KL divergence loss, which is gonna make sure that my, my little encodings are going to look like a Gaussian. This BIGAN architecture has only one loss. You don't have to balance different losses. You don't have to anneal the KL divergence weights. It's kind of all together in one. And there's no L2. There's no designed loss anywhere in here. All the losses are being learned by your neural network. So hypothetically, much more powerful. Um, and as to the second question, is any, any other questions about the A, Andrew? Or does that make sense? It's, it's awesome, but each of these have their own purposes and the cooler it looks, there's a good chance the harder it is to actually make it work. Cool. Um, the adversarial of QZ balanced with the reconstruction loss. Yep, actually, yeah, that, that was, <laughs> sorry I didn't read that question first, but that's exactly what I was talking about. It is two different losses, kind of like how the VAE is two different losses. Even though the VAE, there is a, there is a correct weighting according to the derivation. When you train a VAE, you actually have to take the weight of the KL loss term and like make it small, and then change it over the course of training. And there's a lot of kind of 
twisting you have to do like that. Um, so that's the same thing with the AAE. The AAE has one L2 or whatever, and then, then you have that extra term, which is, and by the way, make this thing look nice and normal so I could reproduce it. Um, and then we compare that to this bigan. The bigan learns the encoder and the out and the decoder. Only one lost term, no L2s, no assumptions about. Um, that's really what it comes down to is the bigan has no assumptions about what makes two images look the same. What makes two images look the same or different is if a neural network can tell the difference between them. And if that, that sentence makes sense, then you'll maybe start to realize why GANs can be so cool. It's, it's not L2, it's not L1, discriminators, none of those things. It's, hey, can a neural network tell the difference between these two things? That's the distance that I want. And then anything you do to that neural network then becomes a part of that loss function. All the, the biases that are inherent. Um, and one last really important type of GAN is called the cycle GAN. Um, what the cycle GAN is, and why I kind of save it for the end, is it shows something that you could only do with GANs. And I, I mentioned briefly the end of class, but I think it's so important, the cycle GAN, to understand why it's different. Um, a cycle GAN, you have two different classes of objects, and you want to learn to convert from one class to the other class but you don't have pairs of objects. And that's why the cycle GAN is unique. That if you had pairs of objects, you could just train a function to convert from one to the other, and that would be how you'd solve it. And you guys could do that with basic neural network knowledge in no time. Um, what a cycle GAN allows you to do is you've got this distribution, you make a function which goes to the other distribution. You've got this distribution, you make a function that goes to the first distribution. You don't know where it's supposed to go, but you can make a function which outputs horses and tells you, does this look like a horse? And that's why you need a GAN. So in terms of training, I put an image of a zebra into the function. I output an image and I want that image to look like a horse. I don't know what horse I want that image to look like, I just know I want it to look like a horse. So you can start to see why something like a GAN would need to be required for that. So if I wanted to output a specific image, I train something with the L2 loss between what I'm outputting and the image I want, and eventually my neural network will output the image that I want. That's your traditional training. What your GAN gives you is, I don't know what I want it to look like specifically, but this distribution should look just like my distribution that I had of horses or the distributions of zebras. And by building that into your neural network, you're able to convert with something you would not have been able to do with a VAE at all. You would not have been able to do this with really any other um, system than a GAN. And I think that's kind of maybe one of the crowning parts of reproducing faces. You could do that with a VAE and I could tell you about why it's blurry or not, but something like CycleGAN is just not something you could ever accomplish with the VAE because of what it fundamentally is doing. So I hope you guys think that's a really cool, uh, powerful technique here. But the idea that a neural network is not given pairs, it's just given pictures of Monet and pictures and regular photos, and then suddenly can convert between photorealism and impressionism without any pairs. Summer and winter, um, I think there were some other examples of cleaning up driving, of uh, night to day, Pl plenty of examples like that. But um, that's just a rough overview of some different architectures of GANs. They all use the basic core GAN at, at the center of it, but instead of just generating one thing, what we looked at was ways to generate conditional things, chains of conditional things. We could generate categorical things and do some unsupervised generation. We can even do some clustering with GANs. 
we could uh, add some reconstruction losses to try to um, make things more interpretable. We can do a full autoencoder, do a GAN on just the middle part instead of on the end. We could do a BIGAN, which is the, the scan that works on pairs and is able to do an autoencoder and is really powerful. We could do cycle GANs, which can convert from one distribution to another distribution. These are all just different ways of taking that core component and applying it to a new, slightly different problem in a slightly different way. And together, this is not even a full list, obviously, because there, there are so many papers on archive. Um, but basically, that should enable you to get a sense of what GANs can do. Um, and with that, we're going to go back to talking about the core problem. So hopefully you guys are excited about GANs and what they can do. And that'll and you get a sense of kind of the broad world of it's not just generating things. It's any problem, really, any discriminative problem, any type of problem you would usually have could be rephrased and handled as a GAN. Um, whether that will take up your entire semester or not, that's a different question. But uh, it's... <coughs> They're very broadly applicable. So let's talk about the, uh, the bad side. This is kind of how I like to, uh, like to split things up. Is I'll, okay. I'll, give you all, I'll, I'll give you all the good things about GANs, all the powerful things they can do, just how fascinating it is that we can talk about perceptual distances and all these powerful things. Um, but then just a little bit in the last you know, 30 minutes or so, um, talk about you know, why it's not perfect and what the issues we have are. So the discriminator, it calculates a divergence, as we've said, and the generator tries to minimize the divergence. Sounds very straightforward. Um, but the actual problem we run into is, sorry, this is actually a bit of a recap from last, from last time, if I can skip through. Um, the problem that we have here, there are many different types of problems. Sometimes mode collapse is a problem. And if I was to pull up a quick, oh, it's gonna lose my spot, isn't it? Um, but one thing you might see, for example, is you generate uh, data and you start training your GAN. And oh no, I trained it on 10 different digits and it's decided to show me all the different ways that it can create the digit one. That, uh, that's, that's a very common issue, which is called mode collapse. And that has to do with the stability of training. Um, another example of a kind of kinds of issues, sometimes you'll train again, and this is what your outputs might look like. Very colorful, maybe sometimes fun to look at, but clearly not the images that you want. So when, uh, when your training is not stable, it can be very hard to diagnose what the problem with your GAN is. So we're gonna talk a little bit about where those issues come from and then cover some of the papers which describe ways to not have those issues. Um, before we get too deep into it, if you guys actually want to make a GAN, please try the improved Wasserstein GAN because that's the one to go. Not the regular Wasserstein GAN, that won't work, and definitely not the plain GAN because that one's going to be very hard to train. <laughs> so the, uh, the long story short of this is going to be, I'm going to go throw you through a couple uh, models on how people have tried to make GANs better. Use the one that comes at the end if you're looking for one to try, or the, maybe the last two. Um, but anyways, the reasons we have these optimization issues are because there are two players that are going and you're so used to single player optimization. That's what all of our regular neural network optimization has been working towards. And suddenly you're optimizing towards a moving target that is moving at some different rate and is being moved by a different optimizer and you're fighting with it. So that means, yes, there's a stationary point, but the guarantees of actually reaching that point go out the window when you're dealing with a GAN. Um, GANs are not guaranteed to converge versus every other network you have. It's, you might get a slightly bad answer, but you're gonna train it and eventually it's going to stop training. 
if you're using a GAN and your parameters are not quite right, it's possible to run and it'll just run forever, making different values every time, going through all sorts of chaos. And uh, wh whether it actually settles down anywhere at all is not guaranteed. Um, part of that's because the updates are simultaneous. The discriminator depends on the generator, the generator depends on the discriminator, and they have to be trained together and training them together in a meaningful way can be very hard. Because if the discriminator is trained too much, it might squash, it might not be helpful anymore. If the generator is trained faster than the discriminator, then you're not getting good meaningful feedback. And getting a good uh, balance between the two of them is important in training. It's hard to get that balance. And if you're trying to just edit the parameters to get them to balance correctly, that can be a lot of work for you. So that's why there are alternates, um, alternate formulations of GANs, which are much more stable and don't run into those issues. Uh, just answer a quick question from the chat. Uh, by GAN, yes, basically. By GAN is when you wanna have both encoder and decoder versus a GAN just trains the decoder part. So if you want the encoder decoder, you can use a BIGAN or you can use an AAE. There are certain advantages and disadvantages to BIGAN versus AAE if you wanna have an autoencoder pair and not just the decoder. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of up to you which one you wanna do and which one works the best. Um, there's several options there. Um, but as to this balance and how it's hard, there are many oscill oscillations. I have some videos of the oscillations, which might be interesting if you want to click through the slides uh, later. Um, but we see that things can be very, um, like I described it as like balancing a pencil, is a pencil has a stationary point, but it's not stable because if you were to graph where the pencil moves, based on where it is, you want things to be pointed towards the, the stable point. That makes a point stable. So what you'll actually see if you were to graph the gradients, um, and I might have some pictures of those later, is that you'll see that we are trying to not only identify here's where we want to be, but we want the gradients to all actually go and push parameters towards that point and not away from that point. Because if you're going away from your stationary point, you're never going to hit it. Or maybe you're just circling around it. And a lot of this GAN training that we're going to look at really quickly is just showing you ways to try to make it more stable and make things point towards that, that center. There's probably no silver bullet. There's still a lot of GAN uh, research and it's been you know five years already. People are still pumping out a couple different spins on it. But things are getting obviously much better and I think we're, we're definitely on the right track, but whether we have the perfect technique yet, probably not. Um, so anyways, we're not gonna cover every single idea. We're gonna cover some ideas which are maybe historical, which aren't perfect, whatever, just to understand uh, what kind of research has been happening of trying to get these to be stable and how hard it was for people to get them. Um, when it first came out, people were like, oh my God, this is amazing, they could do everything if they could just work. If I didn't spend all day toying with the learning rates, because if the learning rate's too high or too low, I get no results at all, as opposed to a regular network. A regular network, your learning rate's a little bit off. Maybe it's blurrier than you want it to be. Again, your learning rate's too high or too low. You get absolutely nothing coming out of it. Just junk. So just a quick list of some of the things, and we'll go through them. Obviously, we're not going to cover all of them. <clears throat> but there has been some serious, incredible work here. And I would say these three papers here are probably the most important for what's going on. This one is important theoretically, but if you try to implement it, you will get junk. These two are actually well posed and reasonably reliable. And if you're trying to build yourself again, these are the two that I would recommend you start off with if you're just trying to build one yourself and get it to work for a project or whatever. So 
Um, this is starting with one of the more historical ones. This is a relatively old paper, actually, one of the, one of the earlier ones. And it is called Unrolled Generative Adversarial Networks. This technique comes from game theory, actually. And it comes from the observation that you've got these two players and they're playing against how they're, they're playing the best option for what the opponent is doing right now, as opposed to playing the best thing for what the opponent could ever do. So what we do in an unrolled generative adversarial networks is we don't just optimize against what we currently have. We optimize it a couple moves ahead. So kind of describe it like chess, but instead of saying, what do what do my actions do that give you the best uh that are the best against what you're doing right now it's how can i update my discriminator such that after a couple rounds of gradient descent of the generator i'll still be doing well so think of it as thinking ahead instead of optimizing against right now you can optimize against a couple steps of gradient descent ahead and then go back through gradient descent and backprop that entire function. Sounds big, sounds complicated, but actually provides a good deal of regularization. This gives you some sort of stability and some sort of uh, prevention of cycling. That instead of just going back and forth between the two players, the players are plotting for what the other one's doing in the future and able to plan ahead for that and actually go more directly towards the stationary point instead of circling around. Kind of uh, beautiful from a theoretical and imaginary perspective. Um, it has definitely been replaced by other techniques, but kind of just fascinating as possible at all to backprop through backprop, think about your opponent's future moves and how they might change and then optimize against how they would change if you had changed. Uh, here's kind of a diagram. I'm not sure if the diagram helps necessarily, but it's basically just trying to show that back propagation is going through gradient descent. So in your actual source code, um, in, in a single training iteration, you're going to do several steps of SGD and then backprop through all those steps of SGD to find what would be the best choice that would be the best even after gradient descent. Uh, in terms of results, um, this is kind of typical of what you would have seen under a regular GAN, which is called mode collapse. So you train it on these different points and the GAN ends up putting all of the mass on one point, and then it, that point kind of moves around sometimes. And maybe it'll just pick a point, but you told it to do this, and it output this. Uh, what error is that called, guys, if you guys can remember? Checking to see who's awake. Just shout it out. Uh, mode collapse, right? Yeah, that's, that's your mode collapse right there. It's, I told you to do all these dots. You gave me one. What are you doing? And the unrolled GAN is able to not have that mode collapse. You're able to actually reproduce all of the images and not cover only a portion of the space. Um, gradient descent is locally stable. Kind of an interesting paper, but maybe not worth spending too much time on. How to train your dragon. Uh, I mentioned just because I think that was a a CMU paper, so you can give it, give us all props, I guess. <laughs> Not us, but you know, uh, I'm trying to remember which lab that was. Um, but also some interesting uh, smoothing. Um, but the reason I'm putting a lot of these papers is just trying to get a sense of everyone's been trying to smooth out again, but how do you smooth it out in the most meaningful uh, fashion? Uh, the numerics of GANs is actually a relatively um, pretty paper, a very pretty paper, a very um, theoretically interesting too. Um, but what it deals with 
is a consensus. If that makes sense. So it's trying to smooth. Uh, it's adding in an extra function, which is called the consensus term, which is you guys are fighting, but here's a small, tiny, tiny loss, which says, hey, maybe you could try to get along a little bit. So we add in an extra term, which is like a de-escalation term. And what that's doing is it's saying the gradient of the loss. So if you're taking an action, which makes the other person's gradient start getting a lot bigger, and maybe that person makes a change, which makes your gradient get bigger, that's going to start a bunch of oscillation, which is only going to get bigger. And it's adding in a term, which is saying, hey, do the best you can do, but if you're making the gradient go up, maybe try not to do that anymore. Just that little extra term, that's what that term is trying to say in, in English, I guess. And by having that consensus, that de-escalation, that the, it's that each person is trying to also minimize the other person's gradients. So things don't escalate, tries to go towards um, minima. The only problem with this is that it also means you're going towards saddle points. It also means you might be going towards maxima. So if you had a very high regularization parameter, you would end up at the wrong point. You wouldn't be doing a GAN at all. But a slight regularization parameter might slightly push you towards it. And this is what, uh, what we're showing here, which is on the left, here's the, what the, the discriminator would usually be producing. This is the vector field of the discriminator. And you can see a couple little points, the equilibria that it is pointing to. That is the stationary point that you would love to get to where the discriminator is outputting all flat and you've got good data. Um, but what you'll see is even though those points are stationary, which you can tell because they don't have arrows going in any given direction, all the arrows around them aren't pointed towards them. So you've got these equilibria, but if you were to follow the arrows, you would just circle around them. We then create a new vector field, which is what they call a conservative field. This is what they add to regularize. And that field points towards the equilibria. It says, just go to the equilibria. But it also goes towards saddle points. It also goes towards maxima. It goes towards minima. But it just tries to, to conserve. It tries to pull things in together. And then you just add those two together with an experimentally selected uh, weighting term. And that's hopefully enough to get it from circling around the equilibria to going towards the equilibria. And you see these are now more of a spiral where before they were just a circle. Um, improved techniques from training GANs. This is actually a very large paper um, which suggested a many, many different um, ways to try to mess with GANs and try to make them more stable. Um, certain, even just smoothing, people write papers on how much smoothing can make a difference to GANs and the details of why it's, it's, it helps are actually kind of interesting and unique to GANs. But with GANs, something as simple as smoothing might make a slight difference between whether you actually get results or don't get results. And because GANs are so uh, tricky and unstable, these small techniques, which might be just um, a little bonus to your normal networks are suddenly very important. Uh, with feature matching, that's an interesting technique. The technique is basically um, kind of similar vein to the cat GAN I was talking about. Um, but instead of just outputting a real versus fake, it outputs a big feature vector. And what the discriminator tries to do is it tries to output the feature vectors so that the feature vectors of the real data are not like the feature vectors of the fake data. So instead of just a single value, a zero, one, real, fake, 
it's a full feature vector and the generator tries to make the feature vectors match. So instead of the generator trying to make the discriminator output a one, it's trying to make the discriminator output many different values, each of which output the values that the real data would have produced. So it's basically, uh, you can think about the discriminator as just extracting a feature from the data and then it's saying the features of the real data and the features of the fake data should be the same. And a good discriminator that can tell the difference is going to try to find whatever features are different. So the discriminator is just a feature detector of what features are different between the two of them. It's a neural network. It tries to train itself to figure out what the current difference between the two of them is, register it, and then the generator ends up fixing it basically. It uses that information just like with a regular GAN, but you're dealing with uh, multi-dimensional instead of one dimension, and that provides some stability. Uh, mini batch discrimination, also a interesting idea, which is that the discriminator can look at, um, instead of just looking at one point and saying this point is real, this point is fake, it can look at two points and say, oh, both of these faces are real or both of these faces are fake. Um, the power of being able to look at two things instead of one thing is your discriminative ability is that much more uh, powerful. So to try to imagine that, try to think about a mode collapse type situation. Mode collapse is when your generator is only producing the digit one. So if I was to take one generated data and one real data and, oh, the generated input was a one, yeah, there's a pretty good chance that it's coming, it, it's more likely to have come from the generator than from the real data because the real data, there's a one-tenth chance and the generated data, there's a hundred percent chance, but you're not sure that it's not real you've got a pretty good likelihood that it's not real. Versus if I was to take 10 outputs from the generator and all 10 of them were ones, you could say definitively, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty sure that all 10 of those, that batch came from the fake data. So basically all mini batch discrimination is trying to say is if you're looking at more samples of data at the same time, you will be, better able to make a decision about whether something is real or fake, especially because of things like coverage that might be easier to see if you're looking at multiple samples at the same time. Uh, hey, Ben, I had a question. Yep. Uh, so if I understood the mini batch correctly, it, you basically wait for the generator to generate, let's say 10 images. And then once you do that, then you have the discriminator uh, analyze all 10 of those images and then provide feedback. Is that the idea? Right, but it's providing a, a feedback on that group of images. So uh, normally like your discriminator takes in one image. It's a function which takes in one image. Now we're actually talking about like a function which takes in a set of 10 and then gives one label for all 10 of those. Got you. So, so the generator... Yeah. Uh, sorry. So the generator only sees the update after the discriminator has analyzed those 10 uh, images as a batch, right? Right, right. So you're actually, you've got 10 copies of the generator, the same exact function outputting 10 different outputs. And then the back prop actually goes through each of those 10. So it's uh, like a set of 10 outputs go into the discriminator. The discriminator gives it a real or a fake. And then the gradients from those go out through each of those 10 and into the generator 10 times that get added up together, just like when you regularly weight share. So it's, gotcha. it's one generator weight shared X number of times and the gradients go through each of those and your discriminator just has multiple inputs. However you design that depends on, on your, your actual neural network side of things. That's just a, uh, network with multiple inputs and one output, but yeah. Gotcha, thanks. And then that's one training iteration for one instance. And then you might do a batch of 20 of those and then that's your mini batch. And then you do that several times. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a, um, 
a little more time consuming, but it gives you that much more power and it does tend to avoid uh, mode collapse specifically really well. Um, historical averaging. Some of these feel like very ad hoc quick changes, but they, they do a job. Historical averaging is just, hey, we're going to encourage things to go towards a mean, so maybe they won't oscillate so much. Kind of ad hoc, but a useful technique. And label smoothing I mentioned already, don't need to get too deep into it, but something like a smoothing can prevent saturation, which can be very bad for your GANs. Um, virtual batch normalization, that's just how to use batch normalization in a GAN. Um, but I think the part I want to spend the last maybe 10 minutes talking about is jumping down to the Wasserstein GAN, which is probably the most important theoretical paper. Um, so you guys may, not, may or may not have heard of Wasserstein distance or the earth mover distance before, but this is um, probably one of the, the, the bigger papers, even if the implementation isn't great, the, the theory is great. So what we have is there is a new formula and this is the loss and you see where'd all the logs go. Don't need a log in here. Don't need any of that overhead. It's a much simpler, cleaner formula. And what it does is actually much better. But before we talk about what it does, uh, we need to explain what the Wasserstein distance is. It is the mass and how far you move that mass to transform from one thing into another thing. So it's a very simple measure of divergence. It's called earth mover, because basically if you had a bunch of piles of sand here and you wanted to make those piles of sand, how would you move it the most efficiently? Uh, what makes this a kind of tricky um, measure and it's, it's actually a distance. It's not even, a, it, it's, a, it's a distance, it's not a divergence. It's triangle inequality and everything. Um, <clears throat> the issue is that you have to have a transport plan. So if you try to figure out what's the smallest amount you can move something, and here, here's a picture of what a transport plan might look like, which is you've got the red, you've got the blue, and it's not just what's the closest red to each blue, what's the closest blue to each red. It's solving the problem of how do I take each one of these mapping up to one of those in the shortest way possible, that the overall distances are, are the minimized. Um, so solving that transport problem is actually very hard. You can think of it as like traveling salesman or anything else, but these are kind of NP hard, well, not kind of, this is an NP hard problem of finding where you should route each thing to each other thing to minimize the distances. It's pretty hard to do in the generalized sense, but we're actually able to calculate the distance without even necessarily calculating the transport plan. Um, and we'll get to how we do that. But anyway, so, so Wasserstein distance is how far things need to move versus KL, you guys have seen KL before, but here it is just to, to speak at P log P over Q. Should you get very familiar with that over your time at CMU because everyone loves KL divergences. Um, but to understand what the KL would give you, let's say your real distribution, all the data is at zero and your generated data, all your data is at theta. So you've got two different distributions and those distributions don't have shared support. In that situation, your KL would actually be infinite until those two things come directly on top of each other and then they go to zero. What that's trying to say is that the KL divergence is not really differentiable in a lot of situations because it can go to these extremely high values. Even if we're not talking about it being zero and going to infinity, um, KL, because it is, um, because of the way it's shaped and because of the way it's written and because it's a log of a fraction, 
they can go to very extreme values and very sharply when things aren't close to each other. And as you get closer, it actually doesn't increase. Um, Jetson Shannon doesn't go to infinity, but what we see is that if you've got two point masses and the point masses don't overlap, then the, the Jensen Shannon divergence is log four. And if those two points get close or they get far away, it's still log four. It's only a zero when those two points actually touch each other. So when you look at these type of divergences like KL and Jensen Shannon, they're really not that good for trying to make two things look similar. Um, if you take more advanced stat classes here, you'll, you'll hear about things like covering and um, they, they tend to have, they, they have a tendency to cover certain parts of the space, but not other parts of the space. When you're using them, you do tend to get a bunch of zeros and, and this is kind of why. Um, the difference is the Wasserstein distance if you've got your data at zero and you've got your data and you've got your other distribution data at X, then the earth mover distance is X. That's basically it. The earth mover distance is how far your data needs to move and therefore it's differentiable with respect to where your data is. Um, maybe I should have started with the pictures and not the, and not the math, but hopefully this will make sense. Um, but the left, is you see as a point moves, how does the Wasserstein distance change? It goes down as it moves closer to where you want it to be and then moves back up as it moves further away versus your idealized Jensen-Shannon divergence right here. If your real data is at zero and your fake data is at any of those other points, your discriminator is gonna output a 0.7 for everything unless it's directly on top, in which case it'll be a zero. So that doesn't sound like something you want. If you were trying to optimize that thing on the right, you would never get to that zero. Optimize the thing on the left, that looks beautiful. You optimize that, you're gonna get zero pretty reliably. And how do we do this? We do this by just um, constraining the Lipschitz constant of your uh, discriminator. So why is it such a big thing is that in your GAN, your regular old GAN discriminator is this red line. Your regular GAN discriminator can go between zero and one, and it's going to be all the way up at one for the area where there's real data, and it's going to be all the way down at zero for the area where there is fake data, and then in between there's going to be a really sharp line and that doesn't really help you that much because yes, you've got a discriminator and the discriminator correctly classifies real versus fake, but it classifies real versus fake with such a sharp line here, this basically vertical red line that you don't have any gradients to work with. You don't know which way to move to go towards that line. It's a, it's a squashing issue. With the WGAN, all we're doing is we're constraining the Lipschitz, so it can never be a vertical line. It can max out at one, which is, you know, 45 degrees. And if 45 degrees is the highest it can get, nothing squashed, you've always got a gradient, it looks great. So these are usable gradients. The, um, I'm going to call that light blue, but I guess I should call it teal maybe. No, I'm, a, I'm not sure what color to call that. <laughs> the light blue is going to be helpful because it's a meaningful gradient you can use to, to go from one place to another versus the red is just vertical. Now, why do we do this and why do we say the Lipschitz? This part gets a little bit into optimal transport theory, a little more advanced math, which we're not going to get too far into, but what you should really just take away is that this earth mover distance, which is really hard to calculate and which is kind of NP hard, you can actually solve it using a dual. And the dual is, requires solving for a function which has a Lipschitz 
that does not exceed one. So we've converted our problem of finding the optimal transport to the problem of how do you optimize over the space of all functions that have ellipsids of one. So beautifully justified, instead of doing Jensen-Shannon, we're doing Wasserstein. We can do Wasserstein distance instead of Jensen-Shannon by really just removing the two logs and then uh, constraining the Lipschitz. So great, everything's clean, everything looks good. The problem is how do we actually do constraining the Lipschitz? Um, Wasserstein GANs was a great paper because it identified what we want to do, but the actual problem of constraining the Lipschitz of a neural network in all arbitrary cases is then also kind of NP hard because it means you have to evaluate the derivative at every single point in your neural network and see if that derivative's one or not. Very hard to do for the general case of something that works on all functions. Uh, the problem with this paper was that the way they constrained the Lipschitz was just to take the infinite norm, which is like the, it, it just like clipped basically. And because it clipped, yes, that limited the Lipschitz, but it caused artifacting. And the response to it was Wasserstein GAN gradient penalty, which covers some of the flaws and tries to fix them. So what the Washington Guy gradient penalty did was if you want the Lipschitz to be one everywhere, then we're just going to sample the function at random points, check what the gradient is, and add a penalty term if it's not one. So we've got our regular GAN, or our Wasserstein GAN, because there's no log term here. And then we've got a regularization term, which is the gradient and one should not be that far apart. And this is much more effective than clipping the values. Instead of clipping the values, we're gonna take samples and we're gonna regularize. It's obviously not perfect because you're taking samples and you're regularizing. So it's never gonna be exactly one. And maybe you're going to miss a sample where it's way more than one and you just got unlucky but you hope you sample enough and train slowly enough that it doesn't happen and it tends to be reasonable. You can't sample everywhere, but what we do is we just sample between real and fake data. We take random points, which are randomly interpreted, interpolated between real and fake data and say my gradient at these random points should be about one. And that's basically all you do. That constrains the Lipschitz and uh, regularize Lipschitz to be near one. And for intents and purposes, that does seem to be much closer to what we wanted. Um, just for some examples, at the top, you'll see what happened with the original Wasserstein GAN paper versus at the bottom, what happens with the improved Wasserstein GAN paper. And you'll see that because the WGAN paper used clipping, you literally end up with straight lines frequently. And it has issues dealing with curves because everything gets clipped um, versus your, your improved Washington GAN, your Washington GAN GP is able to actually do very clean shapes which seem to uh, surround and push things towards the, the real data points where you want them to be. Um, so, the spectral normalized GAN is the last one I want to cover. It's just a quick comparison. So we have a lot of work on GANs and how we can get them to work. We have Washington GAN was kind of the major theoretical improvement, but in terms of implementation, the clipping doesn't work out too well. We have the improved Washington GAN, also known as Washington GAN GP, which uses some sampling to constrain the Lipschitz. That works really well. And we have the spectrally normalized GAN, which is an analytical way. And this is again, uh, 
Spectral normalized GAN, it's a bound, but it's analytical. So it's maybe slightly faster, doesn't involve sampling, but it's maybe not quite as accurate as the Washington GAN GP. And that's the same trade-off I said earlier in class. I'll say it again. You'll see it frequently of the, yeah, that's maybe a little faster, but maybe it's not quite as accurate versus the more accurate versus requires a lot of sampling. The spectrally normalized GAN is using uh, linear algebra to do a similar thing. And it's basically putting an upper bound on the Lipschitz of the function by calculating the Lipschitz of each individual matrix that you're using and multiplying them all together. So you can figure out the Lipschitz of a matrix. It's a matrix transform. That is a solvable problem. It does take some computational power. Um, you exponentiate it, but it is a thing that you can do versus figuring out the Lipschitz of an entire function is hard, but the Lipschitz of the entire function is upper bounded by the Lipschitz of each of the pieces that are going together. And as you guys know, a neural network is just, you know, a series of simple functions. So we take each of the simple functions and then we put an upper bound on the Lipschitz by putting them all together. And that's enough to constrain the Lipschitz without some of the weird artifacting. Um, I do have a couple other random papers in here, maybe not the most important, but all they're trying to say is smooth your GANs, clean them up, maybe do smaller GANs and work up to bigger GANs. Definitely try Wasserstein GANs. Um, there's a, it takes a lot of work to stabilize, but then once they stabilize, everything looks so sharp and clean. Um, and that's kind of, that's how GANs work. Takeaways, if you have an NP hard problem, the best you can do is make it into another NP hard problem, but maybe that NP hard problem will be slightly easier to solve on a GPU, maybe it won't. And maybe solve isn't the right word, but maybe you can approximate it, maybe you can get the dual, maybe you can optimize that. Um, and there's always the, the two issues of sampling based methods which might be unreliable, might require a lot of samples to get accurate, and they're bound-based methods, which are more reliable, but they might get into a poor bound. They might get a local optima, which is not what you wanted because they're not optimizing the real problem. Uh, GANs are cool. I think they're cool. I hope you guys do too. Um, ask me any questions. Plenty of trends in the research, plenty of work to do. You guys can work on how GANs work. You guys can work in GANs for speech. You guys can work in GANs for text. You guys can work in GANs for really a bit of anything. And you can, you can focus on the GAN itself. You can use it as a tool. And uh, however you use it, best of luck. <laughs> uh, tons of current research. And just feel free to look through archive and see what happens. All right. Any questions? Are you guys good? You guys tired for the day? Thank you, Ben. It was really good. Guys, we have maybe a minute for questions. I know many of you have to go on to, go on to other classes. Uh, any questions? Not, well, not really. So thanks, Ben. I'm stopping the recording. Yeah, and, sounds good. Yeah, you guys have seen deep fakes. You guys have seen all the cool deep GANs. When, when you see deep learning in the media with cool stuff coming out of it, it it tends to be GANs these days. So enjoy. <laughs>